This is Sarah, and I just want to take a moment to speak to you about this week's sponsor, Favor. Favor Inc. is a statewide family led nonprofit 501c3 organization that is committed to empowering families as advocates and partners in improving educational and health outcomes for our children. Favor is the Connecticut State Organization of the Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. Favor offers a single place for families with children who have medical, mental, emotional, and behavioral health challenges to find information, assistance, and training. To find out more about Favor, please go to favor-ct.org. We are grateful for our opportunity to work with Favor as a sponsor, and now on to the rest of the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caregiver Chronicles. My name is Sarah, and today I am here with my first guest of the fall. I'm so excited. His name is Spencer Bishens. He is a lawyer and also an author. He has a master's degree from London School of Economics and a law degree from Florida State University. He has worked in Social Security Administration for over 10 years, and he is the author of Social Security Disability Revealed, Why It's So Hard to Access Benefits and What You Can Do About It. Hello, Spencer. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm great. Um, Thank you again. Thank you so much for being here. This is such an important and relevant topic to my family personally, but I know so many of my listeners and friends and family could benefit great from this. Um, But before we get into all that, would you like to further introduce yourself to my audience? Sure. Uh, So my name is Spencer Bishens. I started with the Social Security Administration in 2010, and I started at the appeals level where I reviewed a few thousand disability decisions for correctness with policy. Uh, And then I moved to the hearing level where I wrote almost 2,000 disability decisions for administrative law judges. So I've seen a lot of Social Security disability records. I've listened to a lot of hearings. And I've written a lot of decisions, both favorable and unfavorable to the claimants. So I have a pretty good idea of what the agency looks for, what kind of evidence tends to prove what kind of impairments, where the problems are along the way, but what people can do to give themselves the best possible chance of success in their disability claims. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, And can you just explain to my audience what the difference between Social Security for disability is and Social Security for like a senior citizen? Yeah, it's a great question because in the United States, we're always taught, we're always conditioned when we hear Social Security to think that's something I get when I'm older, right? Well, I'll stop working someday and then I'll collect air quotes, my Social Security. It's just synonymous with retirement. And So a lot of us don't even know that there is a disability program, but that tax, uh, if you're an employee on your pay stub, you'll see federal income tax and Medicare tax, and there's also a social security tax. And if you're self-employed, it's the self-employment tax. Um, But that social security tax is for more than just retirement. It also covers uh, the survivors, the, uh, survivors program, which if you pass away and you have minor children, they can get paid a benefit. And then it also covers disability, which is exactly what it sounds like. If you become disabled and unable to work under Social Security's rules before you reach full retirement age, you can effectively get whatever that retirement amount is at the time you become disabled which of course that amount increases throughout your life as you work and pay taxes into the system. But if you go onto the social security website, it'll tell you if you become disabled today, this is the amount you would get per month. And that's actually the same amount you would get if you were to retire that day. So it's basically the same retirement benefit. You just get it early if you can prove to the social security administration that you meet their very strict standard for disability. Thank you so much for that. Um, This is actually something that we have been kind of, my family has been kind of dealing with the process of that with our son being nonverbal autistic, trying to get disability for him. He's young and he's seven. He's not an adult yet. Right. And um, would you say the process is more difficult for children with cognitive disabilities versus physical disabilities or even adults? 
Well, first, I just want to point out that when we're talking about child cases, and I do cover child cases in the book, that's a separate program. Uh, I talk in the first section of the book about the difference between Title II or SSDI and Title 16 or SSI. Supplemental security income benefits, that's not an earned benefit like we talked about earlier. The earned benefit where people work and earn credit that's Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSDI. But what we're told in our training, if you remember nothing about child cases, you only have to remember three words, and that is kids don't work. And if kids don't work, they can't earn credits, right? So that SSDI program doesn't apply to anyone under the age of 18. Instead, there's another program called SSI, and there's asset and income limitations. And it's, uh, it's a more unstable program. The benefit is lower. I talk in the book about all the reasons why SSI is just, it's, it's a much less good program than SSDI. But for children, it's the only program, as of course you know. So when we're talking about child cases, just like with adult cases, we can split those up into physical, impairments, mental health impairments, or a combination. And I think that it's not so much that it's harder with physical versus mental versus a combination. It's just that all child cases are decided under a different standard. Because Social Security's definition of disability is whether someone can work, or in this case is disabled and unable to work for 12 continuous months, but kids don't work, there's a whole completely different standard for children. And so for children, the standard is about their functioning, uh, basically comparing the child's functioning to that of an unimpaired child. And um, it can be really difficult to assess what an unimpaired seven-year-old is capable of. So there are a series of social security rulings. They start with zero nine. And they go through each functional, there's six different functional domains. And there's this long description of all of the things that an unimpaired child would be able to do with e within each domain. But it's really hard to say, like, is this child different? Are they different in a significant way from an unimpaired child? So Social Security will um, use pediatricians or uh, someone who's a specialist in that particular area. So if it's mental health, they can get a psychiatrist, for example. And they'll try and get a specific assessment where they look at that child's records and they say, the judge will, will really get into that and say, I'm the judge, I'm not a doctor, I don't know. You have to tell me, is there a significant change between a, a fictional unimpaired, a theoretical unimpaired child and this particular child who's coming before me. And I will say this, I wrote a lot of child cases when I was with the agency. They are the hardest cases to write. They're much harder to write than adult cases because I'm not a doctor and I have to look at a description, maybe a, a teacher in a school describes a child's functioning and I have to try and figure out, is that a significant departure from the functional descriptions of an unimpaired child? And that's, that's difficult for a pediatrician to do. So someone like me, who is not a doctor, it can be really difficult for the agency staff to do that. Thank you so much for that clarification. Um, I appreciate that. And thank you for... Um answering that question uh that's I guess it's not as black and white of a question as I thought it would be and I'm I'm yeah. glad to get an in-depth answer on that and I know and I know I didn't give you like a specific answer because there just isn't one it's very case specific it depends on the impairments it depends on the descriptions of the child's functioning if those descriptions of functioning those observations from teachers or medical providers are so markedly different from the ones in the social security rulings, then it can be really easy to say, okay, that's a clearly favorable case, that child's disabled under agency rules. But yeah, if, if maybe some of the functioning looks like an unimpaired child's functioning and some of it isn't, and some of it's more severe and some of it's more mild, then it, it can be really confusing 
and almost always in that situation, the judge will get a medical expert, pediatrician or impairment specific expert to come to the hearing. And the judge will basically just say, you tell me if this child's disabled, you look at the law and you tell me, cause I don't know. Yeah. And, and it can be really hard to judge a person on their abilities over, you know, regardless like what's on paper or, or even just by physical appearance. Um, you can look normal and not be quote unquote, we hate this word in this podcast, but yeah. you can look normal and not be normal. You and that's can- why the agency uses the word unimpaired, right? Because you have medical impairments. So we're comparing the child to someone with no impairments at all. Here's because we don't expect like a three-year-old to be able to read, you know, uh, novels, right? So that's why social security has to know at that age, what is an unimpaired child capable of doing on their own with some help? And if we see, you said seven years old, we know there are certain things a seven-year-old can do, unimpaired seven-year-olds should be able to do on their own and certain things they can't do on their own, right? And so things they, an unimpaired seven-year-old should be able to do on their own, if they can't, then we can have a doctor assess why is that the case? Is this still within the normal range of functioning or is is this outside of normal functioning that would be expected specifically related to an impairment and that's how social security makes the decision as to whether that child would be classified as disabled okay thank you so much for that and that clarification um so and that's and that all kind of comes into what my next question is going to be is what makes the process of like like a disability claim and social security, what makes it so complicated? Because it really seems to be such a complicated process for families. I know a lot of people who, who have struggled, been denied the first time. And I think, I think that you just kind of answered that question is in, it's not black and white. It's, it depends again on what the person should be able to do versus what the person can actually do mentally, physically. Yeah, well, I think the first reason that it's really difficult and complicated is the law. If we're talking about adults, the question is, can you do any full-time work in the national economy? And if you can, have you been unable to do any work for a full 12 months? That's an incredibly strict standard. And even if you think you meet that standard, well, now you have to prove it. You have to have medical records that show that you have impairments that cause limitations in the mind and body that would make you unable to do any work for a full consecutive continuous 12 months. So the first problem is the law. It's just really strict. The next problem is social security, and and this is what my book is about, right? Social security, the system is designed to put barriers in your way to get you to give up, to quit, to not continue pursuing your benefits. The system is designed to deny most people at the initial level. It's not a fair system and it's not a fair look at your medical situation. And this is the part that most people don't understand. They are working, they're working for many years, they're paying into the system. Then something happens, whether it's sudden or chronic over time, they can't work full time and they think, okay, I've been working 20 years, now I can't work, I'll go file a disability claim. I'm sure they'll understand, right? And of course, that's not the case at all. Social Security does not want you collecting disability benefits. And the reason is the system was designed so that people pay in for 30 or 40 years and then collect retirement for a few years. When the system was originally set up and people were collecting at 65, the average lifespan was like 67 or 68. So that's how the finances of the system are supposed to work. You pay in for a really long time, you collect for a short amount of time. Well, people are living longer and that's a problem. But also, if you then have people collecting at 45 instead of 65, they're they're now paying in for 20 fewer years and then wanting benefits. And the economics of that system, they just don't work if too many people are found disabled. So 
Social Security does what they can to keep people out of the system. Um, they will tell you, oh, just give us your medical records. But of course, most people's medical records are disorganized. They're incomplete. They can't get them. I mean, how many times with your own medical records have you been told like, we'll fax them to you or come on in, we'll print them out at 75 cents a page, you know, just pay us $200 and we'll give you your records. Our healthcare system is designed to give people inconsistent care. And then our record keeping is designed to give people inconsistent records. And social security knows this, right? They know if they tell a hundred people, oh, just give us your records and we'll make a decision. They know they're gonna get 70 piles of junk. And so it's no surprise that they deny 70% of their cases at the initial level. Beyond that, they're sending you to doctors who are being paid to give opinions to social security that you're not disabled. They're making you fill out endless amounts of paperwork. They'll lose things and make you fill them out again. Uh, I heard someone say recently that he is a wheelchair user when he's outside of his home. He was sent to a consultative examiner, which is a doctor that Social Security makes you go see. They didn't have a wheelchair ramp at, the, at that office. So Social Security sent a wheelchair user to go see a doctor that didn't have wheelchair access. And then if he didn't go, they would have said, well, he failed to attend and he wasn't cooperating. Right. If that sounds ridiculous, it is. But these are the things that Social Security does to keep people out of the system. So one of the problems is the law. One of the problems is Social Security is just doing everything they can to keep you out. And then beyond that, if you are able to navigate all these obstacles, of course, you have to deal with actually, even if you can get all your treatment and records, you still have to make sure that you're proving that you can't do any full-time work. And um, you know, at that point, at least maybe you're getting a fair look but that's still hard because any gap in that 12 month period and the judge could in theory say, ah, that's not a continuous 12 months. And then even if you get your benefits, social security can and does take them away. Um, and we already talked about with a child's case that there's asset and income limitations. So even if you're approved for your seven year old, make sure you don't earn too much money or save too much money. Otherwise they'll take away that SSI. So it's complicated because it's it's a complicated system, but it's a complicated system because Social Security feels like they have to do that in order to keep the system financially stable. Do you, now, that brings me kind of to my next question um, about how difficult it is to get disabilities, um, disability for, especially for adults. I hear so many times stories of adults who are, and I, and I can't prove any of this. This is most of this is hearsay, but I'm going to ask this question and it might be a little bit of a go there question, but I hear so many stories of adults who are, who get disability, but they can do, they might go work for a friend under the table doing landscaping while they're claiming disability for whatever. Um, Do you feel like this is something that happens often And how do you prevent this? And how do you report this? Well, there's a couple things that you're mentioning there. The first thing is, I'll just say, I think it's stupid to ever work under the table. Anyone who's ever working under the table should really strongly reconsider for a couple of reasons. One, it's illegal, right? Because federal law requires you file a tax return and that you not lie on that tax return. So if you're working under the table, you are breaking federal law. Don't do that. Uh, But beyond that, you're allowed to work. It's within the rules that you're allowed to work and file for social security benefits, as long as you're working under the substantial gainful activity amount, which in 2022 is $1,350 per month. You're allowed to work and claim social security benefits. And even once you're approved, you're allowed to keep working. So there's no reason for anyone to work under the table. You can work. And the the purpose of those amounts is that's approximately, if you take minimum wage and you multiply it by 40, that's about where that amount comes from. So you're saying someone's working under the table mowing lawns. That person's not necessarily 
capable of working full time. Just because you see someone working mowing lawns, they could be mowing a lawn for an hour or two a day. Well, that might be eight, eight to 10 hours a week. They can still legitimately say, I can't work on a full-time basis, right? And that's why they don't need to work under the table because they're legally allowed to work. They can work and claim disability and their neighbors can see them working and want to report them. And their neighbors can say, Are you, aren't you a disability applicant? Yes, I am but I see you're working. That's right. I'm working. I'm allowed to. It's legal. I'm not doing anything wrong. And that's totally true. So um, there is a way to report if you think there's fraud happening, but I will say this. Social security is really good at finding people who are trying to game the system. It's really hard to game the system. I would even say, and I do say in the book, it's basically impossible there's no reason anyone would ever do it. And uh, it's just financially doesn't make any sense. And the amount, like, let's say the, the suggestion there is that person can work full time. The amount of medical records that you have to have in order to prove a disability claim, even if someone was trying to work more than the allowed amount, they've still got a substantial amount of medical impairments or their case isn't even going to be considered. So if they're found disabled, they have a lot of medical impairments and a substantial amount of work-related limitations, and the judge has found that they can't do full-time work. Now, people are allowed to be found disabled and work, but over a certain amount, it's considered returning to work and the disability, I, I like to call it graduating from the SSDI program, and their benefits will end. There probably are people who are found disabled, and then they are able to get treatment and they improve, but they don't wanna to be totally cut off from benefits. So maybe that's the point where people are working under the table. But here's the thing, social security, once you're approved, it's not permanent. Social security conducts periodic reviews and they'll ask for your medical records and you have to provide them or they'll say you're not cooperating. So even that person who's periodically working under the table, they have to continue to show that they medically meet those requirements. Also, at some point, people working under the table, they get caught. And if anyone from Social Security suspects that this is happening, they'll send this investigations team to basically spy on them. And I talk about that process in the book. I like to call these the disability cops. And they will catch you. And then you've got multiple problems because you could get cut off. You could be found to then owe the government that money back. And of course, you now lied under oath on your forms. So now potentially that's a federal crime. So there's so many reasons why it's really stupid to do that, but it's also just so difficult to do it that like, I don't think anybody actually does. So if you've seen someone who you know is on disability or a disability applicant and they're working, I wouldn't assume there's anything nefarious going on. They've most likely reported that they're working, said that they're working, told the judge they're trying to work, and very likely they're earning under the SGA amount. And so it's completely within the rules anyway. Okay. Thank you so much for that clarification. Um, because, you know, you do, you do hear people calling, sometimes even people on disability freeloaders. And I hate that um, because truthfully, we don't know what goes on in someone else's home and how someone else feels into to be disrespectful to somebody who has a physical mental illness. And, yeah. and again, like you said, there's a huge difference between cutting grass for an hour, a couple of days a week and doing heavy yard work all day. So, and I talk about this at the end, end of the book in part six of the book, I have a whole chapter about why fraud, waste and abuse is not a thing. Um, this is a politically charged term and we hear it from politicians normally, right? And every now and then there's a news article about someone who filed for disability who got caught working or going to the beach or eating lobster or some, some ridiculous story. But the reason that's even a news story is because it's out of the ordinary. That's not a thing that is normally happening. Also important to remember, that person got caught. So if we're thinking like, oh, there must be all these other people who aren't getting caught. I explain in the book why that's just not happening. The amount of 
evidence that you have to have over such a sustained period of time of one or two years to try and fake a disability claim would take so much time and so much effort and so much money you could actually just go work and get paid and you'd be economically much better off. Yeah. No. And thank you so much for clarifying that for my audience. I think it's very important. And I think that, you know, based off of that in, in everything you're saying, I think it's more likely for people who need it to be denied rather than someone who doesn't need it to be approved. And I would say that's, would you say that's safe to say? That is what's happening, right? There are so many people who need it who are denied, and th- and that's why, right? It's such a strict standard. And as far as don't need it, I mean, again, that's that's a really nebulous term, right? And that's why the Social Security Administration has a very strict definition because they need to have objectiveness in this process. We don't just say like oh, do you feel you're unable to work? You have to actually prove based on certain legal standards that you're unable to work. And there's impairments with specific elements. And as far as whether or not you can or cannot work in the national economy, certain jobs have certain requirements and the judge will decide you can or cannot do certain things. There's a whole very complex process to deciding whether or not someone can can or cannot work. It's not like someone walks in with a neck brace and goes, I can't work, judge. And the judge just like believes them. That's just not how the process goes. And that's one of the reasons it takes so long and you need so much medical evidence is because it's such a strict standard. But um, I just want to say, going back to a person working, the social security system actually, um, they want people to try working. The judge judges like seeing people attempt work and maybe it's not mowing lawns it might be something less physically strenuous like being a cashier or working in a grocery store right but people if you see a disability applicant I don't know how you would even know they're a disability applicant because that's not public information but it's somehow you do and you see them working that's actually bolstering their disability claim believe it or not because judges like to see you're trying to not need these benefits you're you're telling me you can't work because you've attempted it and you know by trying that you can't do it full time and 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 those claimants tend to be have more credibility in the eyes of the judges than someone who just sits in their house all day not attempting to work so again you know if someone's out working it could be because their representative said hey you should go try working the judge wants to see that It doesn't mean they're lying to the judge. Actually, it could be that they're trying to prove to the judge, hey, I went and I tried to work. And after 10 hours per week, like I'm in such bad pain, I had to go to the chiropractor or I had to go see my doctor. And that doctor can do a physical exam and say, yes, 10 hours a week is too much for this person. But that doctor can only give that opinion if they see them after they work 10 hours, right? So there's a lot of reasons why someone might be working, try working, try doing different kinds of work. And for someone not familiar with how the disability program works, I do understand why people think like, ah, they're gaming the system. But again, and I let, obviously I fully flesh this out in the book, but I explain all the different aspects of the disability system, all the things you need to prove, how judges arrive at their decisions. And then once I've explained that complicated process to you, I can finish up with and so therefore as you can see there's no possible way to game this system it's just too complicated there's too many moving parts fraud waste and abuse you know it their opinions you can have an opinion that someone is abusing the system or being wasteful or committing fraud but that's someone's uninformed opinion as far as the informed opinions, the ones of the agency staff and the judges, that no one, the a judge is ever going to find that you were committing fraud or, or waste. They'll just find you not disabled. And that it's just being found not disabled doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. Maybe you can't work. It just means you didn't meet the very strict legal definition of disability that Social Security has. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, and I know we talked a little bit about income guidelines and things like that. Do you know the income guidelines or the general idea of the income guidelines? Just just one more time. I know we mentioned it and I kind of slipped Yeah, so, so they change every year because of inflation. But for 2022, the substantial gainful activity amount is $1,350, I think, per month. And that's per month. So whether you're earning minimum wage or you're an orthopedic surgeon earning $1,350 per hour, it's the same either way. So it's not about how many hours you can work. You're allowed to work and earn up to that amount per month. But of course, if you're working minimum wage, that amount is pretty close to 40 hours per week. And then if you can work full time, then the judge probably says, eh, you can work full time. You're doing it. You're working 40 hours versus if you were earning a thousand bucks a month, but you know, you were a photographer, we're making 50 bucks an hour and working 20 hours per month. So it's how you're earning it also matters. And the judge will take that into account when deciding if you can do full-time work. Once you're found disabled, that amount comes down. In other words, the amount that you're allowed to earn is less. Now you're still allowed to work and earn that amount, but once you do, you get a, a trial work period credit. And if you get nine of those credits in a five-year period, social security decides you can now return to work. You don't need social security disability anymore and you graduate out of the program. And some people actually want that, right? If you're getting 1500 bucks a month in disability benefits and your prior career was $100,000 a year, you probably want to return to work and get out of the disability program. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of people use that trial work period for exactly what it's intended for, to go back to work while getting benefits to make sure they can sustain it over a period of time and Social Security decides at the point where you've done that for nine months, now you can sustain it. Awesome, thank you. And I know um, another question I have is, I know a lot of times unemployment will have job training opportunities and things like that. And I know that there right. are some jobs that are very physically demanding. I was a nurse's aide for 17 years. That is a physically demanding job. There's no doubt about it. And the very popular one for social security disability claimants, by the way, is it? Really? you have to lift people. I mean, you have to lift humans. You tend to hurt your back and your knees. So that is a uh, CNA is one that I saw a lot. I have sustained a back injury from my job. Um, however, I, there was, there weren't, they couldn't prove that it was job related or birth defect, which I'd never had the issue until one particular incident. Um, all irrelevant though, I, um, but does disability provide for people who were like, let's say CNAs, maybe job training so they can go into something that's not so physically demanding that they could still work at a computer. Like, so this is, uh, I'll admit, this is outside of my area of expertise because there is something called a ticket to work program. And I don't know exactly how that works. I know that a lot of states will provide that sort of training. So I was in the state of Washington uh, and even if someone's receiving federal social security benefits, they can go to the state of Washington and receive uh, job training from the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, and, and that's, if, if you have not yet been approved, that's something that judges like to look for as well. Like, did you seek out job training for something that was less physically or mentally demanding? If you were offered job training, did you take it? Because if you didn't, it looks like maybe you're not trying to work. If you did, again, that helps bolster your credibility. It's kind of the opposite of what people think, but trying to work helps people get approved. If you try your best and still can't work, that's some of the best evidence that you truly can't work. Um, so yes, if you're offered something like that, if you're applying for social security disability, it's a really good idea to take advantage of something like that, to seek it out and take advantage of it if you can. And if you can work, 
great. But then if some, for some reason you can't sustain that, that will help prove why you couldn't sustain that. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. And I, I just want to say one other thing uh, about work. Um, it's it's important to understand the difference with what you just said being a CNA between workers comp and social security because workers and a lot of people who have a workers comp claim will end up filing a social security claim with workers comp the question is why did that injury happen was it on the job or something you had before and can you return to that job but social security doesn't actually care when the injury happened they don't care if it was something that you got while working as a CNA or if it's a birth defect. Social Security takes the mind and the body as they are. And it doesn't matter when that injury happened. If that was something that you had from birth and you were able to work for a period of time, you weren't disabled at that time. It doesn't mean you couldn't somehow be, become unable to work and disabled later especially because you could have a birth defect and you try working and it makes it worse, right? Or, or you know, because a lot of people have a heart condition or a lung condition or some kind of musculoskeletal thing and heavy work can make that worse over time, can exacerbate that condition and that could lead to a disability claim. But Social Security doesn't care what had happened or how it happened. They just look at your impairment and whether your impairments result in limitations that then cause you to be unable to work. Great. Thank you so much for that clarification, too. Um, a good chunk of our audience works in healthcare and our nurses aides, as, as I once was. And I'm sure that this is a question a lot of them ask um, or would like to know. So another question I have for you, and this is a little bit off topic. But what is your favorite self-care activity? Being not around other people. <laughs> um, and that could be at home. It could be walking around the city. It could be going, and this is going to sound weird. It could be going to a sporting event by myself where I'm surrounded by other people, but I don't have to talk to them, right? I don't have to shave. I don't have to like worry about what I'm wearing. Uh, I don't have, like, I don't have to look professional. In other words, I don't have to, sustain thoughtful conversation over a three-hour period whereas like if you go to a baseball game with someone you feel like you constantly have to be talking to them so but I do find that oftentimes we spend so much time um like a, as the Disney company says like their their employees are all on show right so they call them cast members because they're constantly on stage and I feel like we're always all of us are always on stage, we're on show and we're having to be professional or at least be a professional human in front of other people. So sometimes I feel like it's nice just to go somewhere where nobody knows me and I don't have to talk to anyone or sustain conversation or do anything. I can just be there and be invisible to all these other people and just like zone out. That's, that's totally um, an acceptable one. I actually like going out to eat by myself. Um, it seems yeah, for, weird probably it, for the same reason, right? It looks lonely, but truthfully, I'm not a lonely person. I, most of my day is spent with children climbing on me. Um, yeah. and I so think it's only lonely in, if, if you have this idea that you have to be at a restaurant with someone else. If that's your concept of eating in a restaurant, then when you see someone at a table for one, you think lonely versus, you know, we, you and I have Quiet kids time. and, and yeah. our, from our standpoint, it's like, that's not lonely. That's being by myself. And that's different from what I do the rest of the day. And that's why it's a novelty. Exactly. And absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, so do you have any other advice for families or anyone applying for disability. Yeah, and also um, you said a lot of your audience are caregivers or people on the, on the medical side of the equation. And so this advice um, is really for the patients and claimants and their families, but also for the caregivers and the people 
helping to provide the medical care and the medical records. You have to know the social security disability system. It's complex, as we've talked about in many ways, it's intentionally designed to keep you out to, you know, if you're an employee, that tax automatically comes out of your paycheck, right? So they make it really easy to pay into the system, but really, really difficult to get money out of the system. And so you have to understand that the deck is stacked against you. And if you're a medical provider against your patients, and that's why I wrote the book, Social Security Disability Revealed. It's right there in the subtitle. I wanted people to understand all the reasons why it's difficult to access these benefits. And I wanted, I didn't want to sugarcoat it. I wanted to provide a realistic analysis of here are all the problems you're going to face or your patients are going to face. But also, here are the things you can control and here are the things you can do about that. And it's important for the medical providers to know what's going on so you know what your patients are going through, right? When your patients say, I, you know, I got denied disability and you see someone who maybe can't even walk and they're coming in and they're telling you they got denied disability, instead of just thinking, how is that possible? Read the book and then you'll know how it's possible and you'll know how it's possible for so many of your patients and you'll know how you can help as far as the treatment that you can provide, what information you can provide in the medical records, recommendations you can make, such as saying to them, you know, have you thought about hiring a, a social security representative to help you? Because your patients may not have read the book. Um, and ultimately, you'll also learn what to put in a medical opinion, because saying my patient is disabled, that's not sufficient. And of course, most providers don't know that. They think I can just say my patient can't work and that's enough. And it's not enough. Social Security will not consider that to be a medical opinion because only the judge can decide who is and is not disabled. So that's actually a legal opinion and only the judge gets to make that decision. So whether you're the claimant or their support system or the medical provider, you have to know the system. You have to know where the barriers are in order to know how to handle all of that frustration and stress. And then once you know what you can control and how to control that and how to deal with all that, you feel like you have some more knowledge, you feel like you're more empowered, things are less scary because you know what's gonna happen. So even if you get denied, you knew you were gonna get denied, you were expecting that, you're not as frustrated with that situation. And you can say, okay, I was gonna get denied at the initial level. I knew that because I read the book. I now know what to do next. I know I'll probably be denied again, but I'm gonna keep pursuing. I'm gonna keep collecting my medical records. I'm gonna keep going because I know how this system works. I know the points where I am more likely to be approved. And so I'm just gonna push forward until I get to that point. And so, yeah, I feel like that level of knowledge and empowerment is really, really important to give yourself or your patients the best possible chance at having a successful disability claim. Just to conclude, I, I want everyone to understand, there are other books that say something like how to win your disability case. And I'm not promising that you're gonna win your disability claim because no one can, promise that, right? No one can say that you'll definitely win. And as a lawyer, I can never tell any client they'll win their case, right? All I can do is say, here are the strategies that you can use to give yourself the best possible chance at success. I wrote for a lot of different types of judges and low paying judges pay about 20% of their cases. And I wrote a lot of decisions for those judges both favorable and unfavorable. And the thing you have to remember is even if you get a low paying judge, they're still approving one out of every five cases. And that's important. That might seem like a real downer of a statistic, but actually it's not. If you have this information that the other four people didn't have, if you know the system, if you know how to get really good quality medical records over a sustained period of time, if you know what needs to be in a medical opinion, if you know what kind of treatment to get, you'll be that one out of five. And that's my goal is to help you, the claimant or support system, 
put together a disability case that's so airtight that that judge says, I have no discretion here. This evidence is pretty solid. This person's disabled. I can't deny this one. I'm just going to approve this one and move on. And I'll use my discretion to deny the next four. But if you present a case that's so good that you, you make a low paying judge feel like there's no way they can possibly deny you, that's my goal. And I know that that happens because I've written approvals for low paying judges who did just that, who said, this is really good. This evidence is excellent. The representative's presentation was excellent. The claimant tried to work and couldn't work full time. I'll pay that case. So that's, those are my parting words is don't give up. There's always a next step in the process. There's always something more you can do. And there are certain strategies that you can use to give yourself the best possible chance at having a successful disability claim. Awesome. Thank you so much for that important information. Um, just last final question, where can my audience find you? Yeah. So the book is called Social Security Disability Reveal, Why It's So Hard to Access Benefits and What You Can Do About It. And it's on Amazon in paperback and ebook formats. It's also at Barnes and Noble, bookshop.org. You could also ask your local library to carry it and they can get it in paperback or ebook. And all of those resources, including a description of the book, table of contents, and links to all our social media, all of that information can be found at our website, visionspublishing.com. That's B-I-S-H-I-N-S publishing.com. Thank you so much. And um, thank you again, Spencer, thank you so much for being on. I appreciate the work that you're doing. I know that it's going to help a lot of people and help a lot of people understanding and clarifying some things. So I really appreciate you being here. Um, with that, I'll wrap up this week's episode of Caregiver Chronicles. You can find us on all major platforms. If you have any questions about this week's episode, you can reach out to me at caregiverchroniclespod at gmail.com. Please like, share, and subscribe to our podcast. If you really like us and you can, you may support us by um, our Buy Me a Coffee link in the description, but don't feel obligated to do that. We'd prefer you like, share, and subscribe to us. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week.